Hey everybody, it's Brian Asbury, and I just wanted to welcome you to today's episode. If you could, like today's episode, hit that subscribe button, and let's continue to grow the Developmentally Speaking brand. Today my guest, you know him as Downtown Bruno, Harvey Whippleman, and even Harvina. How's it going, sir? <laughs> Another day in paradise. Looking forward to this uh, podcast. And what's the name of your podcast so I can publicize it? It is Developmentally Speaking. Looking forward to participating with Developmentally Speaking from somebody who's mentally speaking. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so let me start things off by asking you a question. You've probably been asked so many times in your career. What made you want to get into this crazy profession? I thought it was the best way uh, I could to make a living at the time. I mean, they were paying me to be in the circus, basically. You know, I started in 1979. And, uh, you know, they were paying me to set the ring and take it down. And I gradually learned how to referee, gradually learned how to manage. And all these years later, gradually learned how to do damn near everything in the business. And this has been my life for forever. since Well, since 1979, so that's 44 years. That's a minute or two. <laughs> What's that? I said that was, that's been a minute or two. Yeah, you ain't lying. <laughs> you ain't lying. I feel it too. So at what point did you decide that this was something you were going to like pursue as a career? Well, April 8th, 1979, which is the day I started. <laughs> they were paying me to do something that, uh, you know, I, I enjoyed and I liked. I mean, it's a tiresome life and it's a hard life but you know what so is uh digging ditches and this, this beats the hell out of digging ditches and when you're digging ditches there's no advancement <laughs> there's always <laughs> room for advancement in, in uh, a crazy world of wrestling so uh, i knew from that day on this is what i was going to do from here on out and uh and i have so you know i'm i'm in the twilight of my career now but uh, i'm still rocking and rolling and uh love every minute of it where did you get your start at uh for a guy named Dale Mann, who run Mid-Continental Wrestling, it was out of uh, Jamestown, Kentucky. And uh, he ran Kentucky, West Virginia, parts of Virginia. And he went on tours. He took me on a tour to uh, North and South Dakota and Iowa and all this. This is back in 79. So that's where I started with Mid-Continental. And then uh, my first uh, territory after that, because his was a, what exactly a territory it was a touring company mm -hmm. the first, <clears throat> excuse me the first territory i worked right after that was uh, for bob geigel the old uh, nwa central states in kansas city mm -hmm. and i went from there to hawaii for uh, rocky johnson and uh, the my Vias. and after that i came home to memphis and got my really big break and just kept going from there so uh that's basically how it all started, uh, you know, in increments. But then when uh, my mentor and the guy that gave me my life, Jerry the King Lawler, gave me a huge push in Memphis that sent me to the moon mm -hmm. in Memphis back in the early to mid-80s. Uh, well, the mid-80s, actually. Uh, it just all went from there. So I owe everything to uh, several people. I owe everything to Rocky Johnson, mm -hmm. Jerry the King Lawler. Uh, Sid Udi, Vicious, Psycho Sid, uh, Sid Justice, whatever you want to call him, who helped me, uh, help, oh, well, he opened the door for me to go to WWF back in the uh, late 80s, early 90s, and uh, and went from there. So those are people that, uh, I, mean, I mean, I've had a lot of good teachers, a lot of good helpers over the years. But those are the, the uh, people that gave me the most in life, and I'll mm -hmm. never forget any of them. So how was Memphis wrestling back then? Is it as crazy as they make it out to be? It, uh, no, crazier. <laughs> rougher. It was, I will tell you, it was a rough life. Mm -hmm. I mean, we had, you know, uh, let's just say there was some people that were hard to get along with at times mm -hmm. in the business. Not just in Memphis, but in the business, hell, in life, to be honest with you, you know. Mm -hmm. but there were some people that... Uh, when I was still fairly new to the business, still kind of a rookie that uh, that were very hard to deal with. Um, and that's why now, after all these years in the business, I've always remembered the people that were pricks to me when I started out. 
I've never treated anybody in a bad mm -hmm. way. They look up to me for my time in the business and what I've done, and I treat everybody like gold. I, mm -hmm. I talk to the young guys in a good way if they mess up in the ring or something, like when I go to the smaller events, mm -hmm. and I talk to them in an intelligent way. I don't cuss them out. I don't make them feel belittled or whatever because, you know, you had guys that would talk to you like crap back then, and I, and I didn't like it. And when I get to the point where I – not that you should ever do it, just because you could treat somebody like crap, not something you should. Mm -hmm. And I've learned that over the years. So uh, I try to treat everybody with the respect that I would want to be treated with, because those who want respect give respect. I couldn't agree more. You know, I, I've seen a couple of independent shows around, and I've had some friends that have trained, and it's always like, there's there. this is how it's supposed to be. I'm supposed to smack the shit out of you for so many times and like you know what i mean like it, there is that the respect factor it's it's earned but like there's like how you do it now there's a different way of trying to help somebody rather than beating the hell out of them and then saying well it's what you could have done yeah i mean there were guys even up to my years and years and years in the business there's some guys if you're just a jerk, you're a jerk, no matter mm -hmm. what. Mm -hmm. Vader was a jerk. I'm sorry. God bless him and his family. I know he's left us. He's a jerk. Another one. George Steele was a jerk, you know? And just because they died doesn't take away the fact they were jerks. Mm -hmm. And I don't mean just to me, to everyone. Nobody liked either one of those guys. Very few people liked them, mm -hmm. you know? Now, some guys are just jerks. Some guys grow out of it. Some never do. I, I agree with that statement very much. Um, so how long were you in Memphis before, you know, you were transitioning to the WWE? Uh, on and off for about, uh, I guess, 10 years. Yeah. You yep. know, I would leave and go to Alabama for a while and come back. Left and went to Louisiana, came back. Went back to Alabama, come back. Went to Kansas City again and came back, but mm. always came back. Even once I went to WWF, I came back. You know, because they work together. So I'd be managing the uh, main event at uh, WWF and mm -hmm. come back and manage in Memphis. Then I started transitioning to the backstage uh, duties in WWF, or WWE, I should call it now. Um, I'd come back to Memphis and referee. And I always had, all, all the way up until the territory uh, ceased to exist, I was always a part of Memphis wrestling. And Memphis wrestling will always be a part of me. And that's mm -hmm. true. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there, there are different uh, organizations trying to, you know, do something in Memphis now. And God bless them all. But I always say this. They'll always be wrestling in Memphis. But they'll never again be Memphis wrestling. And that's just the truth. Mm -hmm. Do you feel, that, this is my opinion, the way that the, the developmental system is now, it's all under one roof. So you all learn one way. Do you feel like there's something missing there? Like when they had all these territories, you would learn this and that, and then you would piece it together. And now that it's all just one, not that there's anything wrong with that, but I feel like maybe the way that it used to be would help you develop you more and your character and, and who you are. Well, no, I agree with you. And, and unfortunately, since there ain't territories anymore, Mm -hmm. It's not something that can be recreated. Mm -hmm. So they have to, their, 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 their hand is forced to yep. do what, you know, what the development of the way it is now, yeah. basically. But, and, and it's true, and, and I'm, I'm sure uh, Mr. McMahon would admit to this himself, that he was a victim of his own success, you know, because uh, when the territories went by the wayside, he had no apple tree to pick from anymore. Mm -hmm. We didn't have back in our day, there was no need for developmental mm -hmm. because like you said, and it's true, there was all these territories. And yeah, so I learned the business. I'm not trying to say I'm the genius of the world, but I mean, I after 44 years, if I don't know the business very, very well, I, I, I must be doing something wrong. I know it very well. Mm -hmm. And every territory was different. So you absorb something from each place you went. And you learn something from each place you went. Mm -hmm. And you incorporate incorporated that into your persona, your work, your whether you're a manager or a referee or a, a, uh, in the ring, you know, wrestler, whatever. Like, 
Memphis was leaps and bounds different from Kansas City. Mm -hmm. uh, Alabama was a lot more Memphis-like, but it wasn't, you know, completely like Memphis. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Louisiana was uh, kind of like Memphis, but in its own way. Kansas City was almost, I guess, I never worked for Vern, but Bob Geigel was like an old school guy, Midwestern guy like Vern. So uh, Kansas City was very non-gimmicky, where Memphis was very gimmicky. Alabama was so-so gimmicky. Louisiana was pretty gimmicky. So, you know, you had to learn from different places. Like, I learned a lot from Bob Geigel in Kansas City. Mm -hmm. One thing I learned from him, I'll never forget this. As a manager, my biggest thing was talking, you know, doing interviews. And we would uh, go and do promos over the TV station in Kansas City uh, on, uh, I think it was on Wednesdays. I can't remember, but what, we'd, we'd all get there like 11 in the morning and do our, our promos. And we all had like 30 seconds to a minute or whatever to do our promo. And Bob Geigler uh, made a statement. Because everybody was like, let me tell you something. I'll do this and do that. I'll let me tell you something. Blah, blah, blah. And Bob Geigler said, you know, you've got valuable TV time to get yourself and your guy and your match over. Mm -hmm. Why are you wasting it saying, let me tell you something? Just tell them something. I never forgot that. I, and I ain't going to say I've never slipped up saying, let me tell you something. But I've always been conscious of trying not to. Because mm -hmm. he was right. That's wasting time. Mm -hmm. Just to, You know, if I was going to have a match with you. Let me tell you something. I'm going to get you in the ring. Let me tell you something. No, I'm out. When I get you in the ring, I'm going to do this, this, and that. Mm -hmm. I just I just saved 30 seconds of the interview by not saying, let me tell you something. Mm -hmm. You know, so, you know, you learn things from wherever, everywhere you go. Like uh, when I was refereeing in Louisiana, I, I never really thought about this, but Carl Fergie taught me uh, when you count somebody, you got to do it head to head so you can see both shoulders if they're down or not. If I'm on the guy's right side or left side or near his butt, I can't see the guy's shoulders. So, you know, you you learn from everywhere you go, mm -hmm. everywhere. Mm -hmm. Now, when you make it to WWE, obviously they put you with all these giants. I think that was very very smart decision, especially back then when you could do smoke and mirrors more often than what you can do now. Right. Right. So transitioning over to WWE at the time, how was it compared to working like all these other territories? It was a 180 degree difference. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying that in a negative way. I'm just saying it, it, it was completely different mm -hmm. because particularly in Memphis, but more, you know, in Louisiana and, and Alabama and Knoxville, I went there too. Um, not so much Kansas City, but everywhere else, I could pretty much have free reign to do what I wanted mm -hmm. at the ring. I could call my own stuff if, if it worked out. It worked out for the guys I was working with. But in WWE, very structured. Mm -hmm. I didn't do the running around the ring and get involved and whatnot. It was more of a laid back thing. Keep the focus in the ring. Managers didn't get to do a whole lot, which mm -hmm. I don't care. They're paying me. Whatever they pay me to do is what I'm going to do. I'm not complaining. But I feel like I could have went a lot further if I was able to kind of do my old downtown Bruno stuff. But mm -hmm. that's not what they wanted, so that's fine. Mm -hmm. No argument, no complaint. But that's the difference. Mm -hmm. I didn't have the uh, – I'm, I'm the world's worst at this, but I think the word is autonomy to do what I wanted <laughs> to do. Very structured. Mm -hmm. But, I mean, that's they wanted to control their nationwide at the time and now worldwide global uh, uh, phenomenon. So mm -hmm. I get that. They can't let just – me do what I want, and this guy do what he wants, and do it. I get that. But that was the biggest difference, not having the uh, free reign, mm -hmm. the leeway to do what I felt like I should do. Mm -hmm. I was just doing what I was told, and, uh, you know, that's the way it was. I just had to learn to adjust that. You know, we see in recent events when you let people do what they want to do in other wrestling companies that it's a, it's a total disaster. Well, I agree. Yeah. But some of these guys, and I'm not going to mention any names. I'm, one thing I don't like to do is put any controversy. Yeah. But some of these guys that weren't even old enough to be alive when there were territory. Yep. So they don't have, to me, the wherewithal to be able to do what they want. Because mm -hmm. they don't know what got over and what didn't in the other place they were because they weren't there. They mm -hmm. weren't nowhere else. They shouldn't have the authority to do what they want. Mm -hmm. You know, 
I mean, I shouldn't either. If I went to work somewhere else, which I never will, but if I did, I shouldn't walk in and say, here's how it's going to be. Yeah. yeah, if I were John Cena or Dwayne Johnson, maybe you're stone cold. Yeah. But I'm not on that level. I don't pretend to be. But, yeah, you do what the promotion tells you. You don't do what you want. And these guys that do what they want, it's obviously not getting over. I've seen some of the houses in some of these places. Mm-hmm. And, again, I'm not going to mention any names yeah. or any organizations. That's not what I'm here for. But mm-hmm. I know yeah. what's going on. I've been doing this too long. <laughs> Is there any particular – person you enjoyed working with that stands out the most in WWE for you personally? Well, I always enjoyed my interactions with John Gonzalez. Mm -hmm. He, when it came to being a WWE superstar slash wrestler slash sports entertainer, unfortunately, he didn't have it. Mm -hmm. Okay? And everybody knows that. But he was an oddity. He was a giant. He was an attraction. Mm-hmm. Where Andre the Giant was very good in the ring, George, Giant Gonzalez, wasn't. Mm-hmm. But he tried. And he was a good person. We lost him way too soon. He knew his days on this earth were limited. He knew that he used to tell me that. But we became very close friends. And uh, it was a challenge getting him to and from the towns and Mm-hmm. What not, but yeah, I just I really, really, really enjoyed my time with him. And then, of course, this wasn't a full time thing; it was an on and off thing. Me and Steve Lombardi, the Brooklyn Brawler, are best friends. We traveled together for on and off for thirty years, mm-hmm. so we always had a good time. We got, we got to interact with the ring or whatever. We always had a good time. I enjoyed, and we, me and him, still talk two, three times a week. So I enjoyed my time with him too. In, in the when we traveled together. So what led to your transition from being in front of the camera to behind the scenes? Well, probably something to do with getting older. Something to do with also, uh, they were kind of phasing out managers at mm-hmm. that point. Then the business changed. But the WWE always respected me and took care of me. It always took care of the old timers. And I appreciate that. Mm-hmm. They knew I had a good amount of knowledge behind the scenes and they put it to use and I just uh, I'm grateful for it I'm gr- very grateful for it how, how did you um, when that first came about is there any particular aspect that you wanted to do more once you made that transition behind the scenes where you knew really. you could I be an asset I, 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 honestly I enjoyed what I was doing uh, uh, behind the scenes you know I'm still part of the WWE but I'm just you know, I'm just uh, not in the capacity I was before, but I just enjoyed J.J. Dillon first put me in that backstage role, and I, I just rolled with it, and mm-hmm. I enjoyed it. And, uh, you know, it's one thing to say, I was a legend. Well, you know what, I'm just washed up, and I, and I, I accept that. I have no problem being washed up. I, I don't have an ego. <laughs> you know, I like the fact that I'm still making a living after I'm being washed up. So I'm, I'm proud of that. You're far from washed up, sir. Well, I appreciate that. You know, and, uh, to me, the biggest highlight of the last whatever amount of years was being a main part of the Young Rock show mm-hmm. on NBC. Uh, I was one of the two uh, executive consultants for the for the uh, wrestling aspect of the show. I was part of the Memphis Wrestling uh consulting team, consultant team, and also part of the Zoom meetings, uh, uh, teaching Ryan Pinkston, the actor that plays me on Young Rock, my accent, and mm-hmm. not really teaching him my accent, but just getting the notes, he could understand how I talk and behave and whatnot, and uh, being a part of that, of course, the great friend of mine, Chavo Guerrero, was the casting director for the wrestlers in the show, and also the I guess you would say physical consultant or whatever, showing the actors like how to take a, a bump or whatever. And, and like the young wrestlers that were portraying other people, he explained to them what to do and whatnot. So me and Chavo were the two wrestling people on that uh, particular show. And that was a great, great experience. And it's not over yet. It's not on NBC no more. But once this writer's, I mean, the writer strike's over. Once the action strike resolves, uh, stay tuned. 
Young Rock will be back. The story ain't over yet. That's good news to hear. I, and I'm, you know, I, I seen the video where you and Dwayne, you know, got together, and it was really a very touching moment. And it it just goes to show you that you do have a lasting impression on people, and you are you're not washed up, and you are one of the good ones when it comes to this business. Well, I appreciate it, and there's a. Uh, uh, you can see that. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, that's when he came back to Walls, Mississippi to visit with me. And we did a thing for uh, CBS Good Morning. Here's my other thing I'm very proud of. Uh, you can see that. Mm-hmm. I was put in the Memphis Wrestling Hall of Fame, class of 2021. And I didn't have these here just for our podcast. These sit on my desk all the time. <laughs> um, and, uh, that's the three most important things to me. My dear friend, Dwayne, mm-hmm. the Hall of Fame induction, and of course, the Lord Jesus. And I can never do a thing without portraying, you know, that to the people. That's the truth. And uh, so right there, boom, boom, boom. <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's my holy trinity. Was uh, Dwayne the one that reached out to you to work with Young Rock? Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. And uh, he's the one that made it all happen. I, nothing but credit. He seems like he's a very uh, res- one of the good people that are looks out for everybody. Wonderful person. Mm-hmm. I've known him since he was a child, mm-hmm. and I mean, we're very close. I would die. I would literally die for him. Mm-hmm. I mean, he's he's made my life. At I'll be fifty eight years old Friday, day after tomorrow. I never dreamed that in my late 50s, I was going to have a brand new uh, uh, trajectory, I guess the word is, in life. Mm-hmm. And I owe it to him, and I'll never ever forget him for it. I'll never, I mean, if he needed a place to live right now, which I can't see that happening, but if he did, I would certainly open my doors to him. He's welcome mm-hmm. here anytime. Absolutely. So as you were working behind the scenes, for all these years, there's a plethora of talent to come through the WWE from from your start until now. Is there any particular people you enjoyed working with behind the scenes, moral talent wise, helping them out to develop them? Well, no, because I never had nothing to do with developmental. Yeah, uh, personally, now not in WWE, but let me say this: when Memphis was a developmental organization with WWE. I worked with people mm-hmm. in Memphis because I was a main, <coughs> excuse me, a main guy in Memphis. Worked for the office, in the office in Memphis, plus senior referee. So basically I didn't do anything with the developmental in mm-hmm. the big, you know, organization. And I never went to, the, you know, Tampa or Orlando or whatever, anything like that. But when Memphis was the developmental league. I had a lot to do with a lot of those guys when they came in, including Dewey, Dwayne, mm-hmm. you know. So, um, I refereed 95% of his matches mm-hmm. when he was here in Memphis as Flex Kavana. And he'll tell you himself, I talked to him in the ring a lot. Keep selling, stop selling, do this, do that, don't do this, don't do that. Do that. I, you know, try to walk him through, you know, and he Mistakes he had. One thing he never had, he had a great punch from day one. So uh, I, I give him credit on that, a great punch. But I had to remind him when to use it, when not to use it, you know. Like one time, you know, he's the baby face. One time he slugged the guy early in the match. I said, what the hell are you, the heel? You don't slug a guy until he gives you a reason to. Oh, okay. I taught him a lot of psychology in the business, you know. Mm-hmm. You know, a, a lot of those guys that were sent there were at, at the time, Ohio Valley, which was run by Danny Davis at the time, Memphis, and uh, I believe Les Thatcher had a group in Cincinnati, mm-hmm. and I believe Joe, Jody Hamilton had a group in uh, Georgia. So where the, they'd send different guys to different places for developmental. Well, Memphis, uh, Dwayne was there, Kurt Angle. I worked with him quite a bit uh, when he was being developed in Memphis. And some other guys that, that are like uh, Baldo, Matt Bloom, who's mm-hmm. actually the head trainer for uh, 
WWE now, which is great. He's a tremendous guy. Mm -hmm. I used to actually manage him at one point after they switched me from referee to managing back in Memphis. Um, but just being in the ring with those guys and just spending time with them away from the ring and talking to them about the business. I, I like to think I imparted some of my knowledge that I learned over the years towards them. Mm -hmm. Like I said, Matt Bloom, uh, Dwayne, Kurt Angle, you know, made it huge in the business. Some of the guys that came through to be developed just didn't didn't make it mm -hmm. through whatever the circumstance was. But I tried to help each and every one of them. Like I, I got along real good with Glenn Kalka, which he was in development. He just evidently didn't make it. Uh, but I liked the hell out of him. Mm -hmm. Mick Tierney was another one. Bart Sawyer was another one. Guys that just, I don't know, for some reason they just didn't get to that position. Mm -hmm. But I worked with a lot of those guys, and I, I did everything I could to teach them what I could about what I knew, you know. Mm -hmm. When I interviewed uh, Bull Buchanan, he mentioned that him, Rock, and Bart Sawyer were down in Memphis together. Yeah, Bull's a great guy. I like him. Mm -hmm. So, like, that territory, when it was developmental, there's not a lot that's online or to see of that Memphis territory for developmental, but there was a lot of people that came through that, like you were saying, when it was very early on in its you know infancy there. I think I've seen Rikishi was there, like, for a cup of coffee. He came through there, maybe. Right. Yeah. He wasn't really being developed because he was already in the bit of, what, 15 years at the time or whatever. Yeah. I guess they didn't have the opening spot for him or what they decided they were going to do with him in WWE yet. They wanted him to be ready. So mm -hmm. I guess they just sent him to Memphis to, to – uh, so he was, you know, in the ring and, you know, constantly working. You know, but yeah, he, he's another good guy. I like the hell out of him, and I'm mm -hmm. proud of his sons, two good kids. Oh, yeah. On top of the world right now. Absolutely. They deserve it. Mm -hmm. They deserve it. <laughs> what are you doing today? Drinking beer, <laughs> eating chicken wings. Uh, you know, I'm an elected official here in my hometown of Walls, Mississippi, here in DeSoto County, on the, on the Board of Aldermen, which I'm very proud of. Um, I'm uh, one of the head uh, officials for Pro Wrestling Mid-South, which is uh, based out of Dyersburg, Tennessee. Mm -hmm. I'm still with WWE, uh, you know, on a washed-up basis. And uh, uh, I, I do autograph sessions and appearances and podcasts such as this. And mm -hmm. I, like to, I like to keep active in the business. But like I said, I'm, I work for the town of Walls, my hometown. Very proud of that. I still have two more years left on my term as alderman and hope I get reelected again and uh, I just stay busy and I ride a tractor all summer I hate that you know the cutting season is almost over basically now because I had, had no rain plus it's fixing to turn cold but I just stay busy I ain't one to sit around and at night mm -hmm. I, just like they portrayed on Young Rock they, they did me right they had my character I just eat chicken wings and drink beer that's all I do I don't smoke I don't use Narcotics and drugs. I'm not a gambler per se. I don't, you know, do any wrong things with the opposite sex or whatever. I just all I do is just I relax with my beer and wings. That's that's my <laughs> life. <laughs> do you have any appearances coming up? Yeah, uh, I really do. I've got uh, tomorrow night, uh, Jackson, Tennessee, for Pro Wrestling Mid South, which is their last event in Jackson, at least for the year. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to be up there as a special guest referee. And then uh, I've got a uh, big, huge event, uh, November 11th in Long Island, New York. Uh, everybody and their brothers on that one. I believe it's called the big event. I mean, everybody's there from A to Z. Mm -hmm. If you ain't there, that means you're still on the road full time for the WWE. Because, I mean, everybody's there. Mm -hmm. So that's going to be a big, huge event. And I'm looking forward to it. I like going up to New York area and meeting the fans and seeing old friends and acquaintances and, and uh, people I worked with. So, uh, but yeah, but uh, if anybody, well, this probably won't air before tomorrow night. I was going to say if it does, come to Jackson, Tennessee and meet me tomorrow night at uh, Pro Wrestling Mid-South. By the time this Gets edited and put out, and then it'll be over. So that's, I guess, <laughs> you know. I'll, I'll, I'll be at the uh, Comic Con in Dyersburg, Tennessee, December the 2nd. 
at the Chamber of Commerce. And that night, there's matches at the Herb Welch WrestleFlex. So um, uh, if anybody sees this, at that time, December the 2nd, Dyersburg, Tennessee. And then uh, also, I, I encourage you to reach out. I don't have no social media at all. But mm-hmm. my dear friend Daniel Matthews, who runs NetPro Studios Wrestling School in Kingsport, Tennessee, he runs a Facebook site or page for me called Downtown Bruno Bookings and Appearances. So if you'll forward this to him mm-hmm. about when they can watch it or listen to it and, and how uh, he will gladly put it on the site, which has quite a few followers. So you'll get, you know, you'll get a lot of people. Uh, hopefully to, to watch it, listen to it. Absolutely. If you had any advice to give to anybody getting into professional wrestling, what would it be? Don't do it. <laughs> and I'm going to tell you, this is God's honest truth. And I'm not trying to be funny, but it's true. Back in my day, we had territories. If they got tired of you in one place or things didn't work out or you didn't like being in that place, I can call Knoxville. I can call Alabama. I can call Louisiana, whatever. I can call, you know, once you're in the business for a few years, you know somebody pretty much in every territory. Mm-hmm. I call up somebody in Knoxville. Hey, you think there's a spot for me? Talk to, you know, Ronald Fuller or call Alabama, whatever. If you didn't know the booker personally, you knew somebody that worked for the booker. There was umpteen places to go. And I always had a place to go. I always had a job in the business. Uh, I only got my notice twice my whole life. It was both in Memphis <laughs> and both my own fault for being drunk and stupid. You know, but uh, I've gave my notice many times, but I always had someplace to go, mm-hmm. you know, because I'd call someone and say, hey, I'd like to come in. Is there a spot for me? Sometimes, well, we'll see what we can do. Or sometimes, oh, my God, yeah, when can you start? Mm-hmm. Um, but now that luxury ain't there, that opportunity ain't there. So I'd strongly advise anybody that thinks about wanting to get in our business to think twice, unless you're independently wealthy or your parents are, don't mind you know, supporting it for a while. It's not something you can just work your way into like I did because mm-hmm. I don't, you don't have Kansas City, Alabama, Portland, Minneapolis. I can sit there for 10 minutes and list mm-hmm. places to go. That ain't the case anymore. Mm-hmm. As far as this indie scene, you ain't gonna make a living at it. Mm-hmm. You know, you might learn something and you might have a nice time, but unless you're like a main guy, you know, or whatever, can go from place to place to place to place to place. He ain't going to make a living at it. And Mm-mm. I just strongly advise anybody from making this their career choice, unless mm-hmm. you really got something to offer WWE that they'll send you to to uh, Orlando to uh, develop. Mm-hmm. Unfortunately, but that's just I'd be doing the world a disservice if I didn't say the truth. Yeah. I don't, I don't know if you could say it all for every sport, but I feel like people, when they get into wrestling, it's wrestling or nothing. There's no backup. It's, I'm going to make a living. I'm going to make it to WWE. And then when you have that mindset, I feel like you forget the whole the whole journey there, which is usually the best part of your career. It's the journey, not the destination. Uh, you, you ain't lying. Mm-hmm. I wouldn't take back nothing I went through, even the bad thing. Mm-hmm. The only thing I would which didn't happen was the the rep that took Joey Morello's life and almost took mine. Obviously, I don't like that. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I mean, who would? But as far as other, anything else I went through in the business, I, hey, what don't kill you makes you stronger. Mm-hmm. You learn from your mistakes and you learn from the other people's mistakes. And you learn to move forward. Like I said, people that treat me like crap, you know what? I moved forward. Mm-hmm. I learned not to not treat other people like crap, you know, and it's just uh, like these young guys, like when I go to Jackson tomorrow night, they want me to referee their match. If I'm not their referee, they want me to watch their match and tell them what they did wrong. And I'll tell them, you know, like uh, we did a town oh, about a year ago in Horn Lake, Mississippi, right here in DeSoto County. And I was a special referee for that match. So the guys locked up and the heel grabbed the baby face by the hair and dragged him into the corner. So what the baby face do? Hey, ref, he grabbed my hair, grabbed my hair. I explained to him real quick. What are you, the heel? He didn't get it. Mm-hmm. We got in the back. I explained to him. No, you go after the son bitch. And I stopped you. I said, why'd you go after him? He grabbed my hair. Okay, that's your baby mm-hmm. face. 
you're the heel if you're crying like a crybaby. You know, little <laughs> things like that these guys don't understand because they're working with other guys on their same level. They might be good athletically, but they don't have the psychology. And there's two parts to every wrestling match. I don't care if you're two guys that ain't been in the business but a month or if it's that gum. Hulk Hogan against Stone Cold Steve Austin. There's two parts to every match, mechanics and psychology. You can't have one without the other to have a good match, period, end of story. Mm -hmm. Well, I just want to say thank you for what you've done for professional wrestling and what you continue to do, sir. I'd love to do this again another time. Me too. Yeah. If you if I can ever do anything to help promote anything you got going on, please feel free to reach out to me. Well, hey, just I want to promote your thing here. I think it's great. Reach out to uh, that website I told you about, Dan mm-hmm. Matthews. Uh, well, it's under uh, Downtown Bruno Bookings and Appearances, mm-hmm. and he will promote this. He'll he'll put the whole thing on there. Whatever you want him to do, he's a great guy. And uh, other than that, just uh, here in two years, when it's re-election time, I'll reach out to you to help me get some campaign contributions. I got to get signs and T-shirts and. Key chains and hats. I got to get reelected in two years. But uh, other than that, I just, just, uh, I, I encourage everybody to please pray for the United States, pray for each other, say a prayer for me because we all need it, and I, I would appreciate that very much. Absolutely, sir. Thank you again. Thank you. Let's do it again soon. Yes, sir.